Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlen. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlen, VP of Strategy at Tripwire. And I'm here with Kai Rohr, who is the Chief Research Officer at Know Before and the creator of the Security Culture Framework. So uh, welcome, Kai. Thank you so much, Tim. Pleasure being here. Glad to have you. So our, our discussions on this podcast, um, they often tend towards the, the more technical topics in cybersecurity. Uh, cybersecurity as a whole tends to focus on technology, but it isn't really just about technology. There are, uh, not surprisingly, an awful lot of people involved in, in cybersecurity as well, both um, as practitioners and as just people uh, out in the world who have to deal with cybersecurity on a, on a daily basis. Um, so I wanted to, to take this conversation a little bit more towards that, that people aspect, but, but I want to start with a question that, that occurs to me um, as we sort of prepped for this, this conversation, this podcast, which is really, why can't we solve cybersecurity problems in the world with technology alone? Why is it from your perspective that technology isn't sufficient for us to, to address cybersecurity? Well, you know, Tim, uh, first of all, a technology is actually made by humans. And if we accept... For now, for now. <laughs> well, you know, even that technology that will build its own technology would have been created by humans, unless, of course, there are aliens somewhere, which, you know, we shouldn't rule out. That's, prob that's probably a different podcast, I suppose. <laughs> yes, pro most likely. Uh, but but but, but uh, the, the challenge here is that technology that we, we use today is created by humans, and humans are, dare I say, flawed. So and, and by flawed, I mean that, that we come with biases, we come with mental concepts, ways we are working that, you know, are not really made to be perfect. And because of that, that whatever it is that we create will never be perfect either. That explanation is, is one side of it, that the technology itself can never be perfect. But I, I think there's more to it than that. I, there has to be, because when technology is interacting only with other technology, um, you can pretty much enforce through the technology itself what happens in those interactions. So, um, you know, sort of an API to API interaction. But we don't do business that way, and we don't deliver services that way. Because ultimately, we're, we're, we're servicing humans, and there are human beings on the other end of that, that service or that organization. So with technology as, as sort of the, the mediator between human interactions, um, you, you can't remove the humans from the process. And so technology has, has, is ultimately limited by that, that fact. There's people and process involved, I guess, would be the other way to look at it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and, and, and this is something I, I think we have been using like for 20, 30 years, people process technology. Mm. Um, and, and I, I think it is very important to remember this, especially if you are like myself, very focused on the people side, or uh, if you're a compliance officer, you tend to be more on the process side. And of course, uh, technologists, you tend to be more on technology. Uh, one thing that we, I believe that we sometimes forget is that these three things are together. So, so if you change one of them, you will automatically influence one of the others. Uh, one example here is, uh, for example, um, seat belts, you know, in cars. This is a safety feature, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the technology seat belts were created back in, I think, 50s or 60s. Uh, and I think actually the Swedish company Volvo has some stake in that, that uh, innovation. Um, but the problem was that no one actually used them, or at least extremely few people. And then that is because people don't really care, or it wasn't cool, or we didn't understand how to use it. Uh, then in the 80s, um, uh, governments decided that, okay, we need actually to, to reduce the, the fatalities of traffic uh, incidents. How do we do that? Well, we need to make seatbelts mandatory. Now, two things happened here. Uh, first, um, 
um, car manufacturers have started to put seat belts in their cars. So not only as a, you know, nice to have, but, but everybody had them. And, and number two, um, people were like, oh, okay, maybe I have to use seat belts. But again, people are people. So even if you have a policy in place, like the uh, government mandatory thing and the technology in place, they still need incentives, right? So, so, so having just the rule and the technology available, if I am not motivated into actually using whatever uh, or following whatever rule, um, I may still not do it. And that, that was one of the issues we saw, especially here in Europe, uh, mid and late uh, 80s when it comes to seatbelts. We didn't use it until such a time that the policy was informed by um, uh, policing. So, so uh, the, the um, police started to pull you over and you were receiving a hefty fine unless you were wearing the seatbelt. And now suddenly we saw a huge change in behavior. And it's it, it's interesting because that, that change in behavior um, for people who who lived through that process, they had to go through that the change in behavior, you know, from a sort of a legislative and, and policing aspect. But people who've grown up with the seatbelt being a habit that they've always had would probably continue using that seatbelt regardless of the the law for the for the most part and so you've you've actually created a, a habit there which is, is an interesting interesting way to think about it yeah and a mental concept right so, yeah. so 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 I still and perhaps you do too uh, remember back in a day when it was like cool to ride your car not using the the, the seat belt because you were like young and tough and invulnerable or bad at risk making risk management decisions yeah. exactly 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 uh, but but now people uh, to, to your point people were like my son I w- growing up is like seat belt no, no that's that's just he, 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 they don't even think about it it's just automatic habit mm-hmm. yeah exactly so is there do you think there's a corollary in, in cybersecurity that, that fits there um, I don't know if there is because the technology changes fairly quickly. Well, um, passwords, for example, um, is something that um, um, it's more more a pet peeve of mine, right? So, so, so one of the challenges we have as an industry is that uh, we give one advice one year, and the next one, and the next year, there is a change to that advice. Sometimes even the opposite advice. Um, so, so just like seat pills, I, I remember that you should never use the same password and then you should use the same password. You should never write them down. Then you should write them down. They should be short and simple. So you remember them. No, they need to be extremely complex and no one can guess them. And, 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 and even today I'm like, okay, so, um, how am I, a human, supposed to actually do passwords today? You'll, you'll, you'll like this, uh, uh, little tidbit, um, so the U.S. government recently put out a, a memorandum on on zero trust, directing the the government to implement zero trust, or at least pieces of zero trust. And one of the the items in there is that they should uh, enforce uh, systems or make sure that systems do not have password reuse or uh, rotation requirements. So effectively, the advice that we've always given out of you should never reuse a password and uh, you should rotate them frequently. Uh, and that we've we've enforced technologically is now being removed from uh, from you know what the, the the U.S. government at least is is suggesting or requiring that people do. So it, it does that those that that guidance certainly does change. Yeah, and 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 this is also another perspective that you have there, right? So so we can use technology to enforce a policy. Right. Or a certain behavior. Or in this case, then remove some, some, uh, constraints that we have deliberately put into the technology, uh, for some reason. Now we choose to remove it for some other reason. Now, now this is actually really, really interesting when it comes to human behaviors. How can we make people do the right thing? Right. And, and we pointed to the policing and, and having the rules and technology in place and then making sure that people actually follow them. OK, that, that's that's one side of it. The other one is using technology and making the technology m- m- force us to do the right thing or, or the thing that we should be doing. Uh, and, and this is another thing that I believe that we should be much, much better at. Uh, and, and there are a number of reasons for it. Number one. 
uh, mentally or, or, you know, as humans, we come with all kinds of flaws uh, or flaws. Like, for example, if I am concentrated on one thing, I may be very difficult to make do something or focus on something else at that same, same time, which may then make me open an attachment or click on a link or um, reuse a password because my mind is not there. But if we can use then the technology to force me to to do the the right thing at that point in time, then you know risk reduced. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on site and in the cloud to find monitor and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. It's really fascinating to think about because so often we consider technical controls as enforcing a policy or enforcing a you know a particular requirement from a standard but really what technical controls do is uh, impact human behavior most of the time um, in some way and if we thought of them as as impacting human behavior or, as, or thought about how they impact human behavior we might actually design them differently to get the outcome that we ultimately want it sounds like that's what you're saying Exactly. And, and, and this is something I believe that we as an industry, uh, especially the security industry, but also the, the computer in industry can learn something from science. Um, one of my heroes, if you like, is uh, Richard Thaler and, and uh, Cass Sunstein. Um, that they have, um, done a lot of research in this area and also published a number of books, including Nudge. And one of their, key messages is that we should embrace the fact that humans are wired the way we are by supporting our um, behaviors by making it easy to do the right thing instead of making it difficult right and and that's where i believe we can learn a lot um especially um uh, people like yourself and myself who who had been in this industry for for quite some time now we we've seen that yes we use technology to enforce some policy but not necessarily in a way that make it easy for the the, the person using the technology often instead the opposite is true by enforcing the policy you you have to do some extra steps and 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 by by taking the research and Richard Toller for example and, and and learning from that we we can adopt the technology and build technology that make it easy for us to do the right thing even if it seems difficult or or strange in that moment i don't know do you remember when, when the first iphone came mm-hmm um do you remember what you thought when you saw this big f- screen and one button only <laughs> No I don't know if I remember exactly what I thought I probably wanted one that's probably what I thought Yeah I I I fell in love with it obviously but I was like okay so um how is it possible with just a screen and one button how can I actually use this right yeah. and, and then what what uh, Steve Jobs and Apple did was to research how can we make it as usable as possible without being hung up on how we used to do things. And this yeah. is something I s- uh, really think that we as an industry should learn more about. Well, so let, let's talk about how that, that, that philosophy relates back to, uh, you know, security culture. And uh, because organizations, whether they, they know it or not, they have some kind of security culture. And, You've spent a significant amount of time uh, figuring out how to measure that, how to influence it. Um, and so how do these these principles that, that we're talking about of, of simplicity and influencing human behavior, how do they relate back to, to security culture for an organization? So, so security culture is all about risk management, right? So, so, so understanding what kind of risk is there, understanding, uh, how the organization, so, so, so the human side of the organization is, 
handling risk, managing these kind of things, or very often not, which is, to your point, part of security culture. You have a security culture, even if you don't know what it is like. Um, and, and then when we look at this then uh, and, and look into to, um, uh, people process technology or, or how to make technology make it easy to do the right thing. Now, what that is doing is facilitating a good security culture, something that makes it easy to have the right kind of behavior, um, which um, influences um, uh, the opinions of security of employees, for example. Um, so, 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 so organizations should be spending more time on um, understanding the needs of the employees, not teaching them every single piece of security that we as security professionals seem to believe that everybody else needs to know as well as we do, right? Uh, instead, try to figure out what is it that person or that team or that, that function, that role needs from a security perspective and give them that and remove all the other pain or make it easy to do the right stuff. So it, that makes me think about how um, when an organization selects a, a particular implementation of some security control, that their their selection criteria are usually technical, usually oriented towards the security team, not necessarily oriented towards whether that particular implementation of the control fits the security culture of that that organization, and that thinking in those terms might actually drive a you know a, a more intentional security culture for that organization. The, the the example that comes to mind is vulnerability management for me because you can implement vulnerability management in any number of ways where you might have a central team that runs it all and hands out you know specific instructions on what to go remediate. You might distribute it so that the business owners actually own that risk and that they're responsible for making risk mitigation decisions. You might you know distribute it to system administrators who then have to fight for resources. There are all kinds of different ways. And I hadn't really thought about it before, but those different ways of implementing vulnerability management are actually, they're, they're sort of the, the emergent security culture for that organization. Is it distributed? Is it centralized? Who owns it? Who makes risk mitigation decisions? All that kind of, of information. And how can you change it? Or even before that, is this organization uh, or uh, way of organizing the work is it something that was decided upon because it makes sense to this organization and, and the risk management of this organization or just, or, or, or did it just happen by accident, which sometimes it does. Uh, so, yeah. so yeah, I, I totally agree with it. This is a very good example of one of the perspectives of security culture. So how does the security culture framework, which, uh, you know, is, has been around for a long time, um, how does that, that fit in here? What's the, the purpose of the, the security culture framework? So, so the main purpose of the security culture framework is to build and maintain security culture. So, so, uh, when, uh, we created that back in 2010, 11, I think it was, uh, very few organizations did focus on security culture. Uh, we were probably a handful of people around the world using that term. Uh, and most of those would be in academia. Um, so, 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 so when that came about, um, uh, the industry were still focusing on antivirus, um, and, and a lot of technical controls and of course compliance issues. And very few organizations realized or, or um, want to, to take it a step further when it comes to training the, employees right so, so so we've had awareness training for a long 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 time and almost you know for for the same amount of time most people hated it right mm -hmm. so, so 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 some organizations realize that we need to fix this if we are considering the employees part of the organization and that there is risk that these employees needs to 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 uh, understand and, and, uh, be aware of and, and train to avoid or change their behavior. And yes, we've been uh, playing a lot with technology, a lot with policies, but it doesn't really cut the chase. We, we need more. Uh, so, so that's the backdrop, that, the, the, the background of why we created the security culture framework. Now, the framework itself is really, really simple. 
It's four simple steps. It's um, uh, uh, modeled uh, based on uh, Deming Circle, the PDCA, uh, Plan, Do, Check, Act. Uh, and basically, um, that's what you do. Uh, you start by measuring where you are today. How, how, how do you know what kind of culture you have? Uh, and uh, what is the culture you want to look like? Uh, then you start involving uh, the organization. Uh, back then, we talked a lot about how do you fund your projects? How do you uh, make a business case? How do you uh, engage with the board and, uh, and uh, executives? Because you need their support. Uh, but also uh, identifying who are the target audience, which is a marketing term, actually. Uh, who do you know uh, or... or who are the employees in your organization? How can you know what they need? So, so, so already there, the focus is on the recipient, not you, uh, the, the sender of security, but, but the organization itself. Uh, and then when you have this ready, it's time to figure out what do they need? What, what kind of activities do we do? Do we give them trainings? Do we set up lunch and lunch? All those kind of things that today is like, yeah, this is how you run an, uh, a program. Back then, no one really knew. And then, of course, uh, when, when you don't know the planning, you run it, you remeasure, you uh, figure out the gaps, and you just do it again with the necessary adaptations. So with the, the security culture framework in place, and it's been there for a number of years, um, I think you're taking this this sort of to a next step with new research. Um, and, and you have a book coming out in April, which is the, the ultimately the, the, the result of that research. So what's that next topic for security culture that, that you're working on? So, so one of the things we are doing now is propose a security culture maturity model. Um, which is something that uh, I've been working with for, for a number of years. Uh, but given the opportunity of working with data or evidence, as you like, uh, we decided that let's dig into the numbers. L let's ask the question, what is uh, or, or what does uh, evidence-based maturity model look like from a security culture perspective? Um, and, and then we just ask the data. Uh, I say we, but uh, ultimately it's it's my team who who <laughs> do those things. Uh, they actually understand how to do those things. I'm more like a talker. Um, but but uh, we, we we discovered that there are a certain kind of behaviors uh, on employee level, team level, organization levels, and industry levels that um, really can help you identify what maturity your security culture has. Um, so some of them are bad behaviors. So basically you expect to see a short drop in, in the bad kind of behaviors, like for example, uh, sharing credentials in, in a phishing email uh, as you mature. But uh, others are uh, improvements uh, in behavior. For example, you would expect to see um, reported incidents, for example, or reported uh, phishing attempts as your maturity, um, improves. And, and, um, that's also the story the data tells us. So, so, so this is, uh, um, for, for, from my perspective, this is a huge, uh, innovation. It's something that I'm very, very proud of and, and very, very happy that, that, uh, my team has, uh, been able to contribute to, to an evidence based maturity model. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. So the, the maturity model, it, it, it presents a, a causal relationship between specific human behaviors within the organization and, um, you know, the the security results, you have fewer, fewer breaches, fewer incidents. Is that, is that a good way to think about it? Yes. So, so, so it's a human uh, perspective of it, but it's not only a, a, a behaviors. It is also knowledge. So, so for example, uh, we measure uh, the, uh, the kind of knowledge and the level of knowledge of, of employees. Uh, we look at what we call the security culture survey uh, or, or security culture index, which basically is 
uh, and a survey that organizations use to measure what their security culture looks like. Uh, and then, of course, the higher score, the, the, the closer to, to, or the better uh, maturity. Uh, and uh, we call these uh, indicators for, for culture uh, maturity indexes uh, and, uh, or indicators. And um, we are building a, a library of these kind of uh, indicators to help organizations uh, navigate and identify where in the maturity model they are. And then based on where they are, also, of course, how they can improve. It seems highly valuable because at this point, I think there are lots of opinions about what, you know, to use your term, what indicators might have a, a, a truly positive impact on on the outcome in terms of security. And having having data and evidence to back that up um, really gives organizations a way to, to, to make decisions, on, on, you know, based on that data rather than based on, on opinions. And that, that has a, a far better outcome for sure. Facts over fiction is one of my favorite sayings these days. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I want to I want to end our our conversation, which has been super interesting. We we could keep talking, I think, but um, I want to end it with um uh the the title of the book, and it's coming out in April, as I said. So what what what's the title of the book? In case people would like to look for it. Yes. So 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 the title is the Security Culture Playbook. And uh, it's published on Wiley and is already actually available for pre-order on Amazon. All right. Well, thank you, Kai. I want to thank you for spending the time. Uh, it was a really fascinating conversation, so I appreciate it. And I think um, it was uh, hopefully interesting and fascinating for everybody who listened as well. Thank you so much, Tim, for this uh, opportunity to share my passion. It's been a great pleasure. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.